Hey Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 301 for Monday, April 26th, 2021. <laughs> Greetings, folks. And welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. Hey, man. I'm in, a, I'm in that between gigs feeling, my friend. <laughs> uh, well, and, and, I, and this is, <laughs> I realize that even by saying that, I'm, I, I am speaking from a position of uh, being very fortunate and very privileged because I have been able to play some gigs on and off throughout the, uh, you know, the lockdowns and the pandemic and things like that. Uh, but my last next to normal gig, thank goodness for that show. Like that, that theater production worked out on so many levels. My son went back to school and we started tech week. Uh, my, and my daughter went back to school as well. My kids went back to school. We started tech week. It, the gigs were, uh, Two a week. That was it. It was, you know, it was kind of a mix and match. They had a bunch of shows going on. I only played this one. So I only was committed for two a week. Usually it was two on the same day, either Saturday or Sunday, sometimes on Thursday, Friday. And then that ended and it was a fun show to do. I didn't really even have to interact with anybody. I just kind of went into my drum bubble. I played this like intricate music that's very immersive. And then I left and, uh, and it was great. But my last one of those was uh, a month ago yesterday, March 25th. And I haven't played uh, a gig since then. I realize it's only a month, but it it really, I, you know, I got into that two gig a week headspace, and um, it was it was good for me. And this hasn't been as good for me, <laughs> but it resumes this weekend, yeah. assuming weather permitting. And I I feel like you know that's going to be the the asterisk all summer long because. Um, I don't know how many indoor gigs will happen, although I think that'll, you know, begin to open up, but weather permitting, I've got a monkey fist gig uh, outdoors on Friday night at that football field that we played at last year. And then Saturday starts our, our string of bitter pill gigs, which, um, which I'm very much looking forward to. It's a private party on Saturday outdoors, but full band. And we had, we've had some rehearsals, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but, um, you know, when it, it, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. In fact, one of the gigs that we have coming up, I've, I've been waiting until I was, uh, until it was out in the open. I could talk about this, but, um, this brewery near us, corner point brewery over in, in Maine, uh, has concocted a brew inspired by the band. And so we are playing the release party in a couple of weeks or the, yeah, I guess the release party is what it would be of bitter pills, a, uh, a bitter Pilsner beer that corner point brewing has, uh, has made that's so cool. It's so cool. Right. Isn't that cool? Like that's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. You know, as you're saying that, I'm kind of thinking, um, there are a lot of great microbreweries where I live here. And a lot of them have, most of them have music. They're basically, you know, they're, they're tasting rooms and sure. you know, cool restaurants. Sometimes they bring food trucks out, but they're, they're really nice hangs, you know, yeah. they're, they're cool. Yeah. Um, Simon started playing one up, up in San Jose, uh, called S27. And, um, you know, first it was him acoustic and it kind of felt that it was a little bit more of a beer house vibe, not a quiet acoustic vibe. And so he brought out bass and drums. I sat in with him one time. Yeah. And it just, it's an interesting thing. I mean, if you back up far enough, if you think about the bar scene, I have a friend, Steve French, who is one of my best, he's a great musician. He's, he's a pedal, pedal steel player. And, um, He's he's a lifelong musician. You know, he he made a life of it. And it was interesting, you know, in the 70s, playing six nights a week at a local bar. I mean, sleep in his own bed every night, didn't have to go on tour. Sure. You could afford to what you made. You could buy a house and live as a, you know, a a, a simple but, you know. Yeah. Well, make, making, a, life. making 100 bucks a man back then worked. You know, the problem is the That's price exactly of houses right. went up and the price of gigs didn't. But, you know, there That's you go. That's exactly right. <laughs> and, um, you know, I just kind of think about it. Back then, when there were so many bars in so many towns, and you know there, those types of things, and then there's been largely nothing. And then out here, I, I've talked about winery gigs quite a right. bit. So wineries like music, um, and clearly breweries like music as well. And so you know that that scene is kind of the new you know gig pool for musicians, which is cool. Although I will say this: not all of them want bands. And I'm noticing that 
um, looping guitarists mm. are a thing. Yeah, bands, sure. duos, sing, you know, duos playing to backing tracks. Sorry, you know, no, no drummers I- involved. Yeah, um, is kind of a thing, and I kind of wonder if that's a like you know, you and I would push forward and say, you know, no, a band interpreting live music is you know is a unique thing and it has a place in the world, and I and I, I don't think anybody would argue with that. Certainly, no one listening to this show. However, if you're just trying to interpret the way markets go. You know, if you were one of those guys who were like, no, disco will never be a thing, you may have missed, and you wanted to be a working musician, you may have missed, you know, a little section of opportunity for a certain amount of time uh, picking up a band playing, in a, you know, in that type of music. So I just kind of wonder if, if in the big picture, that's really what live music is. And does, how does this kind of play for, you know, four or five piece bands? I watched the, the other threads, you know, on the other uh, chats, on, on especially on Facebook, and I know that there are parts of the country where bands are getting plenty of work and, and sure. especially as things are opening up, you know, there seems to be a lot of work for people. But I just wonder somewhat on a, on a mi- macro level, if smaller combos with self-contained percussion, yeah, whether that's, you know, a, a Dave on, on a, on a, on a, you know, something he beats his hands on or backing tracks or, you know, um, or looping guitarists, you know, setting out a beat on the guitar. I just wonder if that is a, a trend line. Oh, I, I, I definitely think it is. I don't think it's new post pandemic either. I think, I, I mean, we've definitely seen that here in the last 10 years. My, my pitch slap Cajon, I have this, this tabletop, I've posted some videos of this. In fact, there's a bunch of bitter pill rehearsal videos that, that are out on Facebook that you can see where I'm playing this thing. And it's, it's a tabletop Cajon. So it's, it's fairly shallow in that sense. Uh, and they, they screwed some guitar pegs into it for me uh, so I can put a, a strap on it and wear it. And I'll tell you, A, it's the most comfortable way to play a cajon. Sitting on a cajon and like hunching over and playing it is awful, to be perfectly frank. Uh, mm. You can get them to sound good, but to sit like that for three freaking hours, like, no, thank you. <laughs> the, seriously, like at a drum set, I can I can actually hold a decent posture if I, if I choose to and still be able to play the drums. If I want to hold a decent posture, my hands are way too far away from a cajon that I'm sitting on. But this thing is great and I can stand and it really does. You know, I put one mic in it. And it sounds, and I can run it through a PA and it's got tons of low end and it's got a little snare sound and it's got some stuff. It, it opens the door for taking those acoustic, you know, quote unquote, acoustic duo style gigs and kicking it up a notch with a little more groove that if people want to move and dance and stuff yeah. like it's there without it being, without you having to have the sort of space and and minimum viable volume scenario for a, a you know an actual drum kit although drum kits can be can, you know you can you can get the volume where you need to in a lot of places but not necessarily yeah. in the corner of a coffee house or something so uh yeah that thing that pitch slap uh in fact i was just what saying do you put in it? i i've had a variety of them i forget which brand i have now but really what i buy is like the mic that your sax player would hate to see me come at him with. Uh, it's like the cheapest sax mic clip on sax mic that you could find like a hundred bucks, maybe 150 bucks. I'm sure it would sound terrible on a saxophone, but putting it <laughs> inside a pitch slap, it sounds freaking great um, because you're not looking for the, the tone of a horn. You're, you're looking to get air moving and a little bit of the, you know, the sparkle of the snares and things like that. And, uh, and it works great. And so I just clip that in there and I'm off to the races and, um, and it works. It's such a great thing because it's, I mean, the nicest part about it is, you know, especially as a drummer that I'm used to, you know, bringing, lugging in, unpacking, setting up my kit, I can get to the gig, help with the PA, you know, do all the stuff. And then literally 30 seconds before I take the stage, that's when I unzip my case for my pitch slap and put the thing on and I'm good to go. Uh, which is kind of a nice little, uh, you know, a little thing, but I was saying to, to Billy yesterday at, or this weekend at, um, at bitter pill rehearsal, I need to order another one of these. So I'm hoping that by putting it in the show here, I'll remember because, uh, it, you know, I, I would assume, you know, me, I like to be prepared and at some point I'm going to put my hand through this thing and that would be bad. Uh, especially with this, you know, slew of gigs this summer, a lots of them are acoustic and B the bitter pill full band gigs. I'm planning on bringing the pitch slap to them and kind of mixing and matching, 
Uh, yeah, with, I think you're kind of exposed. My, yeah. my observation on this is that everyone that starts with a cajon style thing and then, oh, let's add a bass player. And then all of a sudden you're up yeah. to band levels. And that just means you have to smack the thing harder. Well, not so, if you have a mic I mean, in it. Like I, I well, often if, play if, it with my if fingers. you're hearing yourself, right? If, I put if in the monitor. Back, yeah. Ah. It's no big deal. It really isn't. Um, you know, and I. A lot I, of I acoustic gigs fingers. don't have monitors. Really? I play yeah, with monitors I mean, at every acoustic gig. I want to be able to hear myself sing. Yeah. I want to hear the guitar come at me. And when the people in, it's mostly like if the house is empty, okay, great. I don't need a monitor. But as soon as there's people in the house and they get a little caffeinated or they get a little bit of alcohol in them, they're going to be chit chatting. I need to be able to hear <laughs> us over them. So yeah, no, we always, we always throw a monitor down or at the very least use a, you know, like I was talking about last week, the Mackie reach, which is a tower that has like little monitors on the side or something to, to, you know, to hear the, the sound amplified. Actually sure. at, at some acoustic gigs, I've, I've taken to using in-ears. I mean, it, there's no reason not to just put them in. You're good to go. So yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, but it's all part of, it's all part of this interesting dynamic of what are we all coming back to working in, right? True. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have some thoughts about that. We had a, like I said, we had a band rehearsal. We've had a couple of them, but we had one sort of heading into our, our string of bitter pill gigs. I think we've got, I don't know, a dozen or more now that, that Billy's put together. It's freaking great. And I'm really stoked about it, but it was, there was a, I had an interesting day on Saturday, which I want to, I want to talk about because I think as tough as it was getting into pandemic I think it's, for many of us, and I waving my hand here, I think it might be not as easy as we would like getting out of it. So I, I, I want to take a minute and, or maybe more than a minute and talk about that. The first thing I want to do is I want to talk about our sponsor, which is every plate, a new sponsor for us. Hey. Yeah. Every plate is a uh, meal delivery service. They're doing things a little bit differently, and I like what they are doing. We've we had the opportunity to check out uh, some every plate recipes. Recipes, in fact, last night we made uh, sweet and tangy cherry meatballs, which, to be quite honest, is something they picked the recipes for me and sent them to me. I don't think I would have picked that because it sounds a little weird to me. It was delicious. The, the ingredients were all <laughs> super fresh. The way you put it together was easy. They they said on the thing, you know, it has about five minutes of prep time and then about 30 minutes of cook time. And that was true. In fact, all of their recipes come together in about 30 minutes, which is definitely faster than a trip to the grocery store and starting a meal from scratch, right? And they're, they're the, the recipes that every plate sends, they're easy to follow little cards with all pre-portioned ingredients so you can spend less time prepping and cooking. That's why the prep happens so fast, right? And more time you just get to enjoy good food or, you know, maybe some time hanging out while it's like in the oven cooking. The um, the way they do this, they and, and our deal here will get you uh, a meal for just $1.99, which means that they're less expensive than takeout, certainly. In fact, at a dollar ninety nine, you know, uh, one meal from every plate is about the same price as a cup of coffee. I guess if I do the math, maybe even less. Um, so you got to check it out. You can try every plate for, like I said, just a dollar ninety nine per meal plus an additional twenty percent off your next two boxes. And to do that, you go to everyplate.com, e v e r y p l a t e dot com, and you got to use our code in order to get that 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 price. So our code is giggab199 because it's $1.99 a meal. So it's G-I-G-G-A-B-199. You enter that at everyplate.com. And uh, it's like a hundred dollar value that you get. Uh, it works out really well. You got to, you got to check this out. And our thanks to every plate for uh, well, for dinner last night and for sponsoring this episode. <laughs> Sounds good. I got to try those meatballs. Yeah, man, they were good. They, they have like 14 recipes, uh, a rotating list of 14 recipes each week that, that they kind of swap in and out. So you get a lot of variety and, and things like that, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it's good. Uh, all right. So like I said, I had, we had band rehearsal and I, I guess I should back up. We had band rehearsal on Saturday, two days before there was, uh, there's this club, it, the, the, it's a men's club, uh, it, but it really is just a bunch of guys from my, t my local town area that we get together like once or twice a month. We do some things. We do a lobster bake once a year. It's just sort of a, you know, a time to hang, uh, and you know, an easy way to sort of meet the local dudes. And, uh, Obviously, during pandemic, that's been a little bit, you know, there haven't been any get togethers. There have been some Zoom calls and things like that. Not everybody goes to all the, the events. It's really loose and informal. 
And so they were having one actually at the Stone Church. And uh, the Stone Church, the the folks that bought it, renovated the upstairs of the church, which had, in my tenure here has never been used. It's always just been the storage room. But it's a really beautiful room that they renovated and turned into yet another bar and and potentially even a you know a, a stage up there and a, really a function room. And the deal was, you know, going to this thing was um, only for folks that were vaccinated or you know had COVID. So essentially, you know, everybody that's inoculated. Uh, and, uh, and if you weren't comfortable with it, don't, don't come, you know, but it was going to be kind of a loose thing and masks weren't required because we're doing this thing. And I was like, you know, this would probably be good for me. And I know the people that were going, it wasn't a random group of people. I was like, okay, I know these people, I trust them, but yeah, this will be good for me. You know, I'm more than a month past my second dose. Like this is fine. And logically I believe that. And I went and it was fine. I had a beer. I maybe stayed for an hour, maybe less. Uh, and then came home and everything was good. And Saturday, I don't know, I went for a hike in the woods or something. I was feeling, we had rehearsal like later afternoon and that morning, uh, family went for a hike in the woods and I don't know, I hadn't been sleeping well for a variety of reasons. I don't think COVID related, but you don't know it's pandemic, anything, you know, it all factors yeah. in, but there's been some like work's been busy and things like that. And, uh, I hadn't been sleeping well, but I was like really lightheaded in the woods. And I'm like, oh man, I, I got infected at this thing. Like, you, you know, like all those thoughts are going through my head. Now, logically, the chances of that actually having happened would have been so slim. A, I was in a room with other people that were vaccinated. I've been vaccinated. You know, anything's possible. But again, chances are it was, you know, driving to and from the Stone Church was far more dangerous than being in that room with those particular people. But I still was like all freaked out. And thankfully, you know, I have, as I mentioned on the show before, I've sourced a bunch of um, both antibody and uh, rapid antigen tests that I have here at the house. So I gave myself an antigen test and obviously it was negative. Uh, you know, it wasn't a problem. But, you know, as I was going through this, I was like going through this, knowing I needed to go through this and laughing at myself for going through this, like you're being ridiculous, but this is what it takes. So do it, you know, certainly, you know, don't, don't, don't cave into your own peer pressure, Dave, you know, the voices in my head were arguing, just do it and make yourself feel more comfortable. That's why you have these tests, which is what I did. But it was, it made me realize that as difficult as it was to begin pandemicking, I certainly for me, and I think I'm not alone, uh, it will be a rough landing coming out of the other side of this thing. And, you know, I'm, I've been very careful throughout it not to ever use the phrase back to normal or back to anything, because this pandemic is now part of our shared history. We aren't going back to the time before it. We're not going to forget it, uh, but we are moving through it and there will be another side of it. And we're starting to see, you know, glimpses and bits and pieces of that. And I'm thankful for that, but it's not easy. Um, and it's not just going to be flip a switch and forget it all happened it, for me. So for some people, perhaps that's, that's the case. And, you know, I think there's probably good and bad sides to all of it, but, um, but I think for a lot of us, it's going to be a rough landing and, and I think we need to give ourselves permission to, you know, it's our first landing. So I, if anybody, if anybody out there has flown a plane, I've flown a uh, plane a few times with, with an instructor. So we don't even have an instructor for this, but, uh, my first landing was not good at all. You know, it's my no, first takeoff was not good. What's yeah. that? <laughs> you bounced a little. Uh, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Because you got to do that. You don't know what to do. <laughs> it's like driving stick shift, right? Like I can tell you functionally how the car works and what you need to do. But until you do it, you're de like almost certainly you're going to stall it the first time. It's just how it, it's yeah. just how it be, you know, and the same is true with this. We just, we haven't felt our way through anything like this. Certainly I have. So I have a couple of thoughts on this. Yeah. First of all, just the actual data is undeniable. Like of the gigs that I have booked for my band. Yeah. They're different. They're di they it's, Everything's like, different. Yes. Everything's right. different. They're like, Hey, you know, we don't know what the um, capacities are going to be. And so, um, you know, we're doing, we're experimenting with these socially distant formats and, you know, whether we're going to take people's cards and make them prove that they have uh, been vaccinated. There's stuff going on with everything that I know that we are booked for right now. Plus the landscape is evolving, you know, and changing and, you know, the regulations are changing. Sure. So it's, it is, as you say, by definition, it is not normal, right? Nothing is normal right now. And it won't ever I, be like, it won't ever be. Well, like, well, that's the you thing know. I don't know because, you know, there's two parts to this for me. One is uh, we, and certainly in this country, we have enough people 
insisting it be normal that it mm. never happened. Yeah, that's true. I also think humans have very short memories and um, even something as horrible as this. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think that the gravitational pull is for people to want to be normal and that's more powerful than the people who are trying to change normal to a safer new normal. That's true. Feel, you know, yeah, so, for sure. Yeah, I'm very I curious that, but, how but I... In that is conflict. In that is, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious how I will look back on this in 10 years or even five years. Like what will my memory of this pandemic be? And my guess is it's sure. going to be a lot different than what I'm thinking about now. <laughs> we, well, I'm thinking about a, a group, a local group here that, um, they've done, they're, they're a duo and they also play, uh, they also have a band. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what their status of them getting booked is, but sure. I know that they've done a couple of duo gigs and when people try to get up to dance at their duo gigs, uh, the venues said you can't do that, you know, and masks and, you know, and kind of read the rules down. Yep. And these two musicians are like, well, that sucks. And, you know, you know, what, all these rules are suck and, you know, and, and they're just very negative on the whole process of dealing with the current reality. I'm not even going to go normal or not normal. The current reality is a venue doesn't want to get fined. A venue doesn't want to get shut down. Sure. They're going to follow these rules. That's correct. And here we have some musicians saying, this is stupid. This sucks. Sure. Same as they did in the beginning of this. This is stupid. This sucks. And I, you know. To be fair, I, like, I agree that this sucks. <laughs> but, but it's the reality well, of what we're in right now. Yeah. I, what what sucks is that someone is telling them what to do. I don't know if that's what what part mm. of this sucks. Too. I think, mm. I think you're, what you're saying is. This situation sucks that there's a pandemic. Correct. They're, I think they're saying is that how dare people try and rule over my life as a result of this pandemic. And, and that's what they seem to have an issue with. Right. So and within that, you know, so we go, you know, what are we here to talk about music? So within that scenes are weird. Right. So, you know, I, I certainly see what people all over the country, you know, there are people who played straight through this. There are people who are showing pictures of them playing a full crowds and dancing crowds in different parts of the country. You know, if the country takes a big step backwards because the stuff goes on the rise again, what'll happen? Right. If we just push forward, what'll happen? How do you feel about the musician? Here's a good example. I, a, a group I know played a local place where I have played. Sure. And uh, they encouraged their friends to come. Their friends didn't social distance. They did whatever they wanted to do. They got up and danced. The place got shut down for a couple of weeks. That's two weeks that some musician who had a gig didn't get the gig. Yeah. Are you pissed at these people for not behaving? You know, are you, you know, are you pissed at these people for flaunting, you know, requirements, you know, rules, or is it screw it, man, this is rock and roll. We do whatever we want. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. 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 No, I, I, well, I mean, it, it depends on your, the baggage you bring coming into it. Right. If you're the band that's booked the following weekend, you're probably pissed. Uh, you know, like, I mean, I, I think it's tough. I, 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 from my perspective, it seems like that's a pretty selfish thing to have done. Right. And, and certainly not in good partnership with the venue, which really to me is like the bare minimum of putting together a show is you are in partnership with the venue. You're also in partnership with your fans that are showing up, right? Like it's a three-way thing and it can be a win, win, win. That one was not, it was maybe a win for the band. Maybe definitely not a win for the venue and who knows where it fell for the fans. You know, I hope everybody was okay afterwards and it worked out, but yeah, yeah, it's tough, man. That's tough. It is tough, but I, I agree that um, it's not like a, a switch is going to be thrown and we're back to where we were in February of 2020. That's just, that's not going to be it. Maybe likely not until, until June of 2022. You Maybe. Know, will that, yeah. Will that look at all similar, but you know, you get to deal with the hand that life sends you. So again, this is what I talk about, you know, those duos with rhythm tracks and those types of things, adapting. Yeah. You, things. Adapt. you figure it out. Yeah. You know, yeah. We have one gig booked and I'm not quite sure of why this logic exists, but again, it's the venue. They have to run their business, you know, but we have one gig where even though it's outdoors, it's the Portsmouth music hall gig. So, uh, bitter pills booked there on a, on a Sunday. I think it's a Sunday it might be Saturday. Uh, but I think it's Sunday and it's a two show night kind of thing, which is a pretty common thing for this type of a deal where, you know, you play a six o'clock show or whatever it is. I don't get check the times online before you go to the gig. Uh, but you know, you play a six o'clock show, they clear out the crowd. Then there's a nine o'clock show or something like that. And new crowd. And, uh, 
they said, we're limiting it to four band members. And, uh, you know, since the band started without a drummer, it was pretty easy for us to decide, okay, well, Dave's not playing this one. So who else? And so I think it's going to be me and, and Tomer, our rhythm guitar player. And so I, I joked, I said, well, we'll book a gig across the street as bitter third. And, uh, you know, <laughs> or, or we'll show up in the crowd. We'll buy tickets and, and sit there with our, uh, you know, he'll bring his guitar and I'll bring my, my cajon and, and we'll play along with the band, you know, like, <laughs> mm-hmm. but, but it's, but I joke about that. I certainly would never do anything to go against what the venue has decided. And again, I don't, I don't know. And that this is just a true statement. I don't know why they've decided an outdoor gig can only be four people. I'm sure there are good reasons for it, but, uh, but that's where it is. Now, will that change between now and June 20, whatever, when the gig happens, who knows? I think a lot in the world is going to change in the next two months. So maybe that will change too. But at the moment I'm not, you know, I'm not in for that gig, which is fine. It's, but it is like, it needs to be fine. If you don't like it, just don't take the gig. Like these are the venue's rules. You know, maybe we can ask and find out why, but it does almost doesn't matter. Like if that's the rule, that's the rule. Okay. Don't play there. If you don't like it, if your band doesn't fit, we're fortunate enough that we can do bitter pill can play without any one of us. And I believe in the course of the band, any, there, there has been at least one gig where every member, at least one of each of us have not been like there, there was a gig where Billy didn't play. I think there was a gig where Emily didn't play. So like, you know, just how it, it, we're fortunate that we're that flexible and, and, you know, can play in lots of different permutations. It's a good business plan. I mean, it is, it is, it is one way to deal. And I often think about that, you know, in my, in my band, I can't sub the rhythm. I mean, that's really painful. I have on very, very rare occasions. Yep. And it, it has to be a handpicked person who I know will, will do the work to prepare for right. a one off or a two off. Cause you know, our stuff is, you know, like, you know, is a little bit more involved than just, you know, stepping in, not, not impossible, but you gotta, you gotta do some work horns. You know, I will occasionally have a sub on a horn more, more, much more frequently than a, than a rhythm section type of thing. Sure. But it's, it is a, it is a business plan. I told you I have this one friend who, he has a band that does kind of standards, you know, Johnny be good and taking yeah. care of business and that type of stuff. Right. Sure. He has a book. Yep. He can really have any musician in, in town sub for him. If that's he cool. To. He doesn't, de- doesn't really deviate much. And, you know, and that's a business plan, right? Absolutely. That is, a, you know, he, he has a good voice. He has built his following. He gets booked. Nobody's there to see the, the rhythm section. There's no expectations of a show from the rhythm section, you know, if you can play in the box, you can get a gig. If you play in the box, I like it. Yeah, but that makes sense. Like that's, yeah, sure. Right. And then then there's the bands that are highly choreographed and that's harder to harder to sub and, and uh, or more painful to sub. Yeah. I actually do think of this about it quite a bit. So my horns over the evolution of time, you know, they I got them. They all played in a big band together. Oh. Um you know, they saw my band as work, not as I, cool. I'm joining a band. They saw it as sure. X amount of filled dates, and it took a lot of years. And, and I think a lot of horn players are like this. I mean, they kind of they kind of conceptualize a gig as a very transactional thing, right? And you know, to get them to understand you're in a band, and over time, <clears throat> as I would feature them or call out their names or introduce them, they would start to get their own little fan bases. Each of them, of course. And when one of them is not at a gig and one of their fans shows up and doesn't see who they came to see, they're a little disappointed. So risky in my part investing in that. But at the same time, I was determined to change that philosophy that, you know, even though they're on the website as being in the band, they are a band member, not a not a replaceable part. Right. And, you know, that means many things in many ways, not the least of which the tightness of the show, not the least of which I've invested in your fame, in your exposure, you have fans, you know, don't let your fans down, show up at all your gigs. Don't, don't look at it as, and one guy, you know, early on, he subbed himself out of my gig for one that played better at the last minute. And that was the last time I ever used him. Yeah. Well, I mean, you'll run into people like that. And I, I mean, yeah, I, I, not a band guy. I've seen, right. It, and I, I, I suppose it could be argued that that happens more frequently with horn players, but I mean, I've seen it with guitar players. I, sure. I, in fact, I have one that comes to mind whose name I will not mention because there's no reason <laughs> to call him out. Although maybe I should like, this is not a guy I would ever mm-hmm. hire again. I'll go have beers with him. 
Uh, if he hires me for a gig, I will happily play with him, but I will definitely never put him. He's at the very best. He's at the bottom of my list. And it's because the day before a gig that required a lot of prep, he said, yeah. Hey, look, you know, I've got, um, this gig, you know, I, I feed my family with my musical income and I get this gig at this other place that's going to pay me three times as much as as this one. So, you know, I guess if you could increase my rate for this gig, I could Ugh. decline the other one. It was like, oh, man, like, no, wow. No. wow. So short sighted, right? I mean, how much how much work did he not give with you, you know, right? on, on an ongoing basis? So, Absolutely. Oh, yeah. It was know. like, yeah. I mean, And maybe it worked out for him, I think, in a, you know, I mean – we all have ways of, especially as musicians, we figure out how to make life work for us. You kind of have to, right? You, you know, <laughs> so the great rationale machine, the great rationale machine, but also just like bullheaded persistence. Like, okay, you know, <laughs> I got to get more gigs. So how do I do that? And you just stay with it and you nose to the grindstone and, you know, hard work and, and he figures it out and he's still playing, which is good. I'm, I'm glad, but I just, he's unreliable be it, by definition. And it's like, okay, well I can't, you know, when we talk about a gig and it's a date and the money and then this, like that's locked in, man. And look, if somebody has a problem, you know, you call me and you say, look, my, you know, I broke my arm or my wife's in the hospital or I'm, I, you know, work happened and I need to be in Cleveland and it's like, sorry, like all of these things factor into, do I want to call this person again? But the, the three that I mentioned are something that I would consider forgivable versus the, look, I'm going to take another gig that came up unless you pay me more. That's less forgivable in my Well, book. That, that's heinous, actually. I mean, I, I think- <laughs> I was being he didn't kind. Come to you in the yeah, he didn't come to you in the beginning and say, hey, listen, I'll take the gig, but well, I got to take the highest paying gig. And, you know, and then you get to choose whether you want to risk that. Correct. And then everybody got all the information from the beginning. That's right. That's different than the day before saying, hey, I'm about to cause you a problem yeah. unless you do. You know, that's that's just not good. And And, you know, like many things in life- your reputation is everything. Like, yeah. like once, like I have no problem telling other horn bands about this guy who did this to me and saying, I, you know, if they asked me, I have no problem saying he bailed on a gig the day before. And you know, that, that should follow someone like that around. I mean, I, I do think that that's, that's just not cool. It's, but, and here's the flip side. I've had, I had a cat play with us. He actually plays in Sly and the Family Stone. Nice. Right? Yeah. He is, he is a big freaking deal and he's a fantastic freaking player and he's a really good guy. He committed to a gig to me. He supposedly got offered something else and he honored his gig to me. So Nice. That's good. That, well, there you go. Right. Like that's, I've been in that scenario where I've had, you know, a gig come up and it's like, oh man, like, no, I, I can't. And I've even, I've, I've, there was one scenario where I was booked and another gig came up and I declined it. And it just so happened. I was on the phone with the, the, you know, the, the manager, the person who managed the, the band that I was booked with. And, uh, and I happened to mention it to them and they're like, Oh dude, you should take that other gig. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like it's not going to happen. <laughs> and they talked me into it. They're like, Nope, you know what? I can fill this. Like, and they even said, I totally get why you're doing what you're doing. That's a great gig for you. Not just for the money. Like you definitely should take that gig. I'm going to fill this one and open you up to that one, you, you know, and, and, and this is not a strike against you. And I was like, okay, well, thank you. I said, let me call the other guy first because I already declined it. Let me make sure it's yeah. not already full. He's like, yep, absolutely. Just call me back. Let me know. He's like, but this is my decision, not yours. I'm like, okay, <laughs> like I get it. Thank you. But it, this was a, you know, a relationship I'd had for five plus years, whatever it was. And uh, I think I did wind up switching gigs, but I, even with it, like all the permission in the world, uh, and I was still like, this just doesn't feel right because I'm trained to do exactly what you said, manage your own reputation. You have to. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's moments that come up where it's like, oh, you know, I like work or whatever. I've got to decline a gig that I shouldn't decline. Even just saying no to a gig, not, not, not screwing somebody, but you know, gig offer comes up. It's like, nope, sorry, I'm going to be out of town. Like, I know that if I do that too much, I, I fall to the bottom of the list because you called me and I wasn't available. That also yeah. makes me unreliable. Like that's I, the game. That's the game. Like it's, there's no harm, no foul, except the phone doesn't ring, <laughs> you know, and, and it's just the choices you make. So you gotta be, sure. you gotta be really self-aware of, of that. I don't know how we got from rough landings to these particular axes that evidently we both needed we to do. grind, but that's what we do. That's right. <laughs> <laughs>
sometimes the axe is there and the grindstone is rolling. So not yep. to mention a temporary left turn out to a tangy cherry meatballs. So <laughs> tangy cherry meatballs. That, man, those things were good. The, the great part about like there was <laughs> the great part about it was there were only three of us. We had a, a meal kit for four and it, it truly was enough for four. And so there's some leftovers, which, which I might go grab before I uh, head off to teach my class, which is great. There so, you go. Yeah, man, it's good. Got anything coming up that you're particularly excited about? Well, like I said, these two gigs this weekend, if the if the weather is is uh, is good, we're playing that uh, football field in Sandown with Monkey Fist on Friday night and then Bitter Pill at a private party in Rochester, I think on Saturday. But uh, How far is that? Uh, Rochester, New Hampshire is maybe 20 minutes from me. It's, these are all local oh, relatively. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. The sand down. the main gig? How far is that? Oh, I'm like, I'm 10 minutes from the main border here. So oh, okay. yeah, it's a little weird in New England for people that aren't used to this area, especially where we are. You know, I'm an hour from Boston. I'm an hour and a half from the Vermont border. I'm probably four hours from the Canadian border. And as I said, about 10 minutes from the main border. So it's, um, it's all sort of very f flexible and. You know. Next next time I will um, regale you with my tales of me taking the turnarounds, for the three hour gig with a you know three hour drive, go do the gig, three hours home. Yeah, that's that's going to be a thing for me this summer. That that's um, that's I've done that n not frequently, but enough that I know what you're talking about. So yeah, <laughs> let's we'll, we'll put that on the list. I want to hear about I want to hear about how how that works out for you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Cool. Well. That's what I got. My axe is ground, man. Uh, do you have anything else to talk about for today? I don't, man. But, um, okay. you know, you bring your axe to this conversation anytime you want to. <laughs> That's what we do. We're musicians. We always bring our axes. It's how it goes. <laughs> 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 All right, folks. Thanks so much for listening. Make sure you check out everyplate.com and use that gig gab 199 uh, code so that you can get your, uh, your meals for 199 Food. Food. It's good. Good for the soul. Always be performing. Always be performing. I like it. See you next week.